Greetings everyone and welcome to the final final episode of us playing as uh, Guangdong now with the Book of Master, who a fault confessed a Book of Master that is, as we're still doing a reignition. But our government reinforced. What does not kill us makes us stronger, thank goodness. The government of our state and its legislative council for all their manifest inefficiencies and inherent design flaws managed to survive the prospect of complete collapse and emerge in a more or less functional state, but we do well to remember that we could not have, survived, could not have happened without Fujitsu's well-deserved dominance. As a new era sets in, it is time for the chief executive and his team to check in on the state of the government. While his daddy will want to reaffirm to the rest of the Japanese governing class of Guangdong that Fujitsu will, as always, remain the sole pillar upon which he can rest for support, spring, spring cleaning. A book has been so long cooped up inside the government complex. They had forgotten what the outside world looked like. It had been his own little train carriage as Guangdong passed to heck and back, though he wondered how more comfortable his own ride had been, but that mattered no more. The streets of Koshu beckoned and they were beautiful. Doubtlessly, the riots still left their mark on the cities he walked through the morning sunshine. Every other street he passed seemed to have crews clearing rubble or scaffolding and developing high rises for improvised development. And Corda still blocked off much of the city. But this was all healthy, signs of growth, improvement. Things maybe still be slight broken, but there are obvious indications that the problems were being paid attention to and promptly dealt with. After all, wasn't that all he ever wanted? Art of the past was moving far behind him, and yesterday's future was here too, soon to be tomorrow's antiquity. It booked a look to the sky, for once the day was clear, and the sky opened and the sun shone over Guangdong. Admittedly, a formless, undirected, unharnessed light. But yet one brimming with infinite potential yet to be realized. Harnessed once more and more with each passing day, soon the sun would be set once more. And Koshu's great collapse of possibilities would unveil itself once more, a million leading lights to all that could, should, and must be. Nature's light would be miraculous, but the light of civilization was relevatory. There was still much to do, of course, and so much now that could be done. Guangdong and Ibuka himself had both answered hard questions about themselves and where they were heading. He just hoped that he had made the right decision. Feeling an onset of heaviness, Ibuka stifled a yawn and decided to head home. The city may never sleep, but an old man needs his rest. And who in the right mind can forget about the brilliant men of Fujitsu? The pioneers of the new technological order, bringing bright lights of the new electronic golden age. Even the daggers of hate and envy were pointed at them from every direction during the world historical disaster that the oil crisis. Uh, they persisted in their labors. Heck burned and the high waters churned, but the Fujitsu worker kept working. Kept innovating. Not even myriads of riders could stop them. As Guangdong moves on from the riots and its prior history more generally, Fujitsu will need to find the right uh, way to put these brilliant people to use so as to ensure that we, they, we can continue innovating for all of eternity. Reconciliation. Imperfect. When Li Hei realized that he had to go to talk to his brother in prison, tell him what he decided, he felt torn. He would briefly think of that he didn't feel like it, but then another part of his mind would rise and revolt against him, telling him that he had already betrayed his brother enough times. In the end, Hei took the plunge and went to China prison. Chun glared at him through the windows, but that glare was slowly faded away as his little brother spoke. Ah, Chun, I, I've caught off a plan for Zushi, in fact. I'll be cutting ties with the Fujitsu for a while. I decided my own engineering firm. I'll pose, it'll pose some challenges, for sure, but I know I can still pull it off. By now, Chun's face was more neutral, but he didn't uh, speak still. Hey, breathed deeply. Closed his eyes and shook his head. Big brother, I I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I've caused you and the rest of the family so much trouble. Chasing after something I did truly didn't need to shine, I've allowed myself to forget who I once was. Where I came from, brother, I please forgive me. Tears were in Hay's eyes. He bowed his hand. Chun, on the other hand, smiled, smirked coldly. But his voice betrayed the warmth he felt. Perhaps there's still something left of you to be proud of, little brother. Reconciliation, and not just for Ibuka Masaru. Yet another screaming match. In all outrage, I tell you, this honorable member, after all our fair state was brought nearly to its knees, would have us go ahead with such irresponsibility. The honorable member is lacking in imagination as he is in conviction. In order for the future to be secured, it is imperative. Imperative what? Throw ourselves off a bridge? A vain throb in Ibuka's head. Is it too much to ask for the members of the Legislative Council to conduct themselves in a manner befitting the state they represent? He bellowed out. Representative Uchida rose to speak. He'd been running his mouth on a lot since the riots ended, even as he clung to Fujitsu's coattails when things were still in flames. I would encourage the chief executive to remember his own actions in the past months and the importance of the legislature in mediating his excesses. Our government is a collaborative body, after all. And he book a small devish, del devilishly. Of course, judging by his voting record, Mr. Uchida is no stranger to collaborating with the better heads than his own, something I hope will continue in the future. And I would remind all the honorable members here that the complexity of calibrating a machine is far simpler than designing and assembling one from scratch. That's something we Students of engineering were taught very early on, though it seems business school is not the same in this regard. A flurry of angry and passionate speeches emerged from the Lico floor. Like a parade of squawking chickens, Ibuka thought about responding once more, then shrugged his shoulders. Opportunist that he was, Uchida had a point. Well, it was occasionally useful, so we may as well let this one go. He just wished it could be more useful than often. Our citizen re reinvigorated. Historians and sociologists will argue about the cause and effects of the Guangdong rise for decades, but they, as a populace itself, have all clearly learned one major thing from this event and its aftermath. What was that, what was that lesson, you ask? It is that our model of excellence works, even in the face of crisis, and that not even some petty rabble-rousers can shake it off its foundations. This truth has at last been etched into the hearts of all of Guangdong's people. In this new age, whether or not they were part of the rioting rabble, they will work. Uh, they will see no reason to not happily abide by it, and will work ceaselessly towards their very best and foremost, and forevermore. The people will embrace the future, kicking and screaming they must. Tempora 
Mutantur. Lee Weiss had done with her parents, Leong and Mai, for a family dinner. Chun and Hei rarely showed up these days, but for the few times they did, it was together, uh, which Wai was, knew was definitely a good sign. Another sign, good sign for Wai, anyway, that she just had her graduation ceremony at high school. But the few things Wai had observed that she just had to share with her parents. Most of the time, before Jing Sam did what he did this year, there were only representatives from Fuzitsung, uh, right? Well, that isn't the case anymore. I saw people from Sony Sunga, but why cut herself off? But what? Oh, I, Leong asked, while coughing a bit to his worsening health. But no, Jetlap man, none at all, and all three of them smirked. Why well, continued? I'll have to get a hold of an internship, and it's quite likely going to be on a labor intensive side, I won't lie to you. And I want to work to afford college for myself someday, seeing as how his income isn't the most stable quite yet. Her parents responded to that with cautious pride, but Wai's mind wandered as the conversation changed with everything. Their arrival in Koshi, the riots, the book is terrible, no good, very bad mess. I haven't played out how it ended, or had, but things get better from here on in. Nos et mutamor in ills. And so the light shines on. Yasuda, Matuzawa, Suzuki, these names and others were once great powers and influence holders in the state of Guangdong. They were known for their power and influence, but also for their inability to innovate in the face of changes in the world. But now, with the passage of time, the rise of Chief Executive Ibuka Masaru, those influences are no more, mere relics of the past. Free to last from the old, un the, an innovative, and co incompetent reality, a recovered, strengthened, and prosperous Guangdong is at last ready to reach a new stage in a smart shot forwards. Though we may have compromised on some matters and help from on others, the end result is all one. Guangdong, for all of our efforts, all of Fujita's efforts at Under Ibuka's vision, is resplendent with technological mind and is at last place to make claim to the title of the river. The jewel on the Pearl River, here in 72, is a fruit of Ibuka Master's labors. A new Guangdong, it says Guangdong, revolves to the engineer Citadel, the eternal chaperone. Look, our rivals are tearing us to shreds, as is, says Takasaki. I'm not going to ask you to rewrite it, but can maybe can you retool it to a little bit more moderate? Yoshiko resisted the urge to laugh. A little bit more moderate, huh? A little bit more cowardly, a little more in line. Of course, she'd be committing no bigger betrayal against herself than anyone else. She'd be committing, uh, including those who brought this society about. In the face of overwhelming public opposition, even though some brute nearly taking over, taking her hostage, she had fought for what she believed in, for what she assumed they believed in. But no, Ibuka had taken the side of her would-be kidnapper, and so everything from now on would be more moderate. The more things change, the more they say the same. Until the Yasuda crisis, she had spent her whole life being chaperoned around, shunned to two, and from where her aristocratic family decided that she was more useful to them. Here, she thought she had found something else. The path and profession to call her own, a way for her life to be a tool of her own expression. But that was seemingly not the case. Once again, she was being called upon when useful, then stuffed away when that was no longer the case. She could quit, pack up her toys and leave. She'd been deprived of everything but her name before, and she pulled through then. Surely she could, should, should, could do so again. No, that was foolishness. Outside of this place, the name Yasukawa would have been forgotten long ago. Moderation would have to do. Yasukawa, are you listening? Yes, sir. What remains? The crunching of shattered glass echoed across the facility. Within Yamauchi's ears, he well, walked through the remnants of his endeavor. Hardly a single device he had managed to survive the, both the destructive uh, riot and brutal crackdown. While well, protesters had been crushed, right? The police didn't seem particularly concerned about the safety of his property. The executive gazed, numbly at the scene, buffeted by the cold morning air, taking a seat, began to think, Sure, things seem bad, but they could always get better. He'd been through hard times before, he just needed a little more time to get back on his feet, and then he could get back to work, right? A loud bang jolted Yamauchi out of his chair, and as one of the great piles of junk collapsed under his weight and scattered itself across the factory floor, there would be no second chance, he realized. His debt grew bigger every passing day, and the banks wouldn't take any more reinsurances and promises in lieu of payment anymore. Even worse, Fujitsu had decided to pull support from his company almost immediately after the destruction of his facility, citing the recent incident as evidence of his non-viability in the competitive environment of the nation. With a sigh, Yamauchi, suddenly the devastated warehouse, the building was nothing more than a rotting remnant of his ambition, waiting silently to be swept away in favor of the new. The image of his bright and hopeful beginnings faded from his mind, replaced by the barren reality. There was no home from here, not anymore, and across the land. The numbers, be they financial, production, manpower, anything else, continually increased all thanks to Guangdong's brilliance and Ibuka's vision. At last we are free to leave the brutish backwards of industrial hack that is Guangdong behind, but it only seems that Manchukuo is no longer our only rival in the sphere. The Republic of China, the motherland of Guangdong, has begun a frankly admirable process of modernization. Their five modernizations seem to have equipped them to start up firms and initiatives of their own. But it matters not. Whatever challenges or opportunities that land in the north brings, they only prove Ibuka's point that the Guangdong that we built is unmatched in its technological power and might. And we're here with this. I don't think we'll get this one done, but we can, we can attempt at least a little bit. We're going to do this, this, uh, burn a little bit of good ball there, uh, do that, do that. Like normal. Uh, Shinkim Kulmon. Okay, I'm fed in Koshu. Some place in Macau. Oh, I didn't read this one yet. Uh, Yazuka man was talking or taking an important contribution from a hapless citizen. An officer of the always intrepid Guangdong police rushed over. A policeman and gangster went into an armed standoff while the victim beat a hasty retreat. The officer groaned in rage and made way to walk, but then they lectured the officer that had foiled him. 
It won't be so easy next time, you blue cap dude. Don't you know that no one's in charge of this crap hole anymore? The feed crackled and focused in on Stanley Ho, released from prison due to at last successful attempts or efforts from Morita Akeo. As he returned to one of his old casinos in Macau, that had been protested from destruction, protected from destruction, thanks to the same man that had saved him from prison. Stanley felt hollow. For the old time's sake, he, perhaps he would continue, but business would never return to normal again. Feed crackled one last time to focus in on a hallway in the nondescript building in Koshu this time around. The man tattooed in the stereotypical Yakuza manner handed the documents into a room where, unbeknownst to the camera, Yokoi Hideke sat behind his desk. The reports were satisfactory all across the three proles, Hideke noted, relaxing for the first time since the start of the oil crisis. Perhaps his excellency wasn't so certain about it all, as he had to once let himself to be. So then he probably wouldn't have to have the heart to stop the good business from continuing, would he? Would he? In the meantime, the camera crackled and died. From this beacon of greatness, our chief executive, a book of monster, was never one to sit down quietly and accept whatever he was to be given, be it good or bad. We all have heard him say time and time again that Guangdong cannot limit itself to being the brightest technological beacon of the co prosperity sphere. No, he says, our calling is greater than that. Sometime back, in fact, our esteemed chief executive's rhetoric reached a new height. No, it's not enough. We must prove ourselves once and for all that we're in the right. We have no need for slave labor, as the madmen in the Einheit's pack profess, nor for the foolish overemphasis on civil liberties and equality like the bleeding hearts of the OFN, no. By meritocracy and innovation, we shall benefit and shine upon all mankind and pass the best that the Westerners and anyone else has to offer. As we approach, finally approach our rightful place in the global limelight, the other peoples of the beautiful, tormented Earth will see the fruits of our intellect, and they will behold the results of your adherence to my vision has brought us, and they will sit down and learn from the pearl rubber delta to shine the future of the world. Cool. As it should. One foot on the platform. <clears throat> the second hand Toyota rode a bit too bumpy on the dust dusty road, but compared to the equally crappy police car, at least it was something Lamb had earned with his own paychecks. The last of them, anyways. Before the month long break, he finally found, found himself he had time for. A small price to pay for the chance to drive back home, not as a member of the Guangdong Police Force, but as, of course, himself. He sat pulled up the handbrake, opened the door, and stepped once more into the soil upon which he was raised. He really forgot all about this place, it seemed, until he laid eyes on the blueprint popping up on his desk three days ago. The Shenzhen Research and Digital Accessories Park, it had read, one chunk of lines and crosses neighboring Hong Kong among dozens, boys to supplement its financial eminence with sheer technological might. One more fantasy that his tides clashed and voices in the Lekos world had never come to pass. A small fishing village could remain, would remain, a small fishing village, just as a house before him had remained under the Lam uh, family name. Just as after all these years, Lam Hao Sun had remained Lam Hao Sun. The sunlight caressed his face in his plain white shirt. As he heard the doors creak open and watched Ma, Uncle, and everyone else peek out from inside, the curious wonders on their faces erupting into a cocktail of emotions in a splinter of a second joy, apprehension, disdain. Whatever they threw at him, he'd take it all in. It was the black sheep after all, the Chinese who had flown to reach the Hong Kong sun, only to have his wings burned to a crisp. The Zhujin who sold a sword of the Baohinia ba badge and then trained the pistol upon. Uh, as a countryman would whisper in his ears, first Hayashi Kozin, then Officer LCO 49, and now just a man with the only courage left to face the loved ones he'd almost thrown out of his head. He closed his eyes, felt the cacophony of footsteps closing in, and threw open the pair of arms he knew were his. It was the best he could do. I am the sand in the bottom half of the hourglass. Nice. Well, we're getting there. Static burst. Uh, a new crisp, clean sound, the next generation in. Fuck. Effing Guy Zai. It's okay, dear. You'll be promoted next time for sure. Citizens are reminded of the importance of respect in the workplace, regardless of ethnicity or creed. Police, open up. What do you mean? The rent already went up last month. A whole new world awaits, brought to you by. You may work alongside us, but it'll never be one of us. The 20,000 yen you owe us, or there won't be a next time. Washed up in the harbor. The future today, the more they stay the same. Almost 77%. 75%. We're actually capped with Zushin support. That's pretty good. You know what, if that's the case. The begin of all the greatness. So I'll thank Koshu. The sun beat down from the sky, frying the brains of all the present, yet the utterly massive, unprecedented international industrial exposition of the city of Guangdong was filled to the brim left, right, and center. Typical monster was a reminiscent of the chaos of the Tower of Babel, but in far better circumstances than that. Sony, Masashita, Hitachi, so many corporations, both large and small, heck, even Lee Hay's small startup, competed with Fujitsu and its myriad dependents for the attention of a thousand thousand Gaiko Kujin, or Gaijin, as Ibuko rather prefer to call them. Americans, Germans, Mexicans, and all other sort of people from all over the world came to Koshu and colored themselves cautiously impressed. Ibuko's emotions were mixed as he beheld the spectacle. He wasn't even sure why he loosened the requirements for corporate entry when Morita Matsushita had pestered him about it after the let go some days back. Maybe it was just something that Fujitsu had no choice to do, but after all, after admitting to this and Fujitsu's mistakes, it went without saying that Fujitsu had to concede a fair portion of power even to Hitachi dudes. Or perhaps, perhaps, after everything he, Mas Masaru, at first he'd done it to everyone, he just had to do it, yes. That could just do well 
very well be the reason, maybe. Regardless of the reason, all Guangdong's finest show in the day and upon our hearts. Everything is going back into motion. The, the mo economy is stabilizing. The people at last calmed down. The past is further and further away from us, like Coast you in the rearview mirror as we drive south to Hong Kong or north to the frontier. But perhaps we can take a moment to reflect on our history before we can fully leave it behind and, and our founding, the heirs of Suzuki and its predecessors. The struggles that our chief executive went through to build up the state of Guangdong of today. True, Guangdong. Remains a mere patch of land close to the South China Sea, trampled, trampled in by warlords and revolutionaries to our north and their unmoving waters to our south, but we have never been the sort of people to allow ourselves to be bogged down by the physical limits. For we took a broken legacy in hand and made it new, surpassing even the highest height of the old. We have every right to take the pride in that, and every reason to use it to make Guangdong even greater than it is today. A peek outside. I take that the external Secretary Kamai was once again unable or unwilling to show his sorry hide. <clears throat> he asks his aides, who all quite nodded. Or nodded quietly. Very well, we shall simply go ahead without him. Proceed. He beckoned one of the aides closest to him, holding a clipboard. First, Sin King has made a formal protest to Tokyo concerning the desperate amount of investment Guangdong receives compared to Manchu. Unimportant, said Ibuka. They are irrelevant prattling to the envious and incompetent. If they had spent their time and resources on something other than livery and arrangements for the fake aristocracy all those years ago, they would be receiving more next. Another aide step forward. Well, as I'm sure you're aware, the Republic of China has been issuing protests concerning the purported exploitation of our Chinese citizens for some time now, from all sorts of different ministries and government organizations also. I'll go pile a list right here. He handed the clipboard over to Ibuka. Uh. <coughs> Ibuka skimmered through the papers for a moment and put him down. I see nothing new here, he said. Frankly, I'm unsure what the Nanjing expects from us. Our Chinese citizens also hold much greater opportunities than those of the Republic, and encourage them to make better use of their own population. Next. Knowing better than to challenge Ibuka, the aides changed topic, even as the subject of China continued to eat away at Ibuka. Ten years ago, perhaps his assessment would have been true, but he knew better than anyone. A lot could change in the time, after all, he had underestimated issues before. This would require special attention away from prying eyes, can't overlook the small details and across the seas. Old Great Japan, our fair homeland, originator of our existence. The chain to which our fates were once tied until the coming of Ibuka Masaru. No longer shall we subordinate ourselves to you, as we march into the brave new rule that you have built. Under the honored chief executive, we have surpassed you, O Japan, even as you once surpassed our Europeans and Chinese. When we forged our own destiny, we had no need of your help. When we innovated and created glorious things unheard of in human history, we did not require your assistance. O oh, our brethren, we thank you for your love and kindness to us, but we salute and honor you as compatriots. But now, here, if you have ears, we are no longer your servants or tributaries. Granted, we will fulfill our duties to you and the Emperor. We will do our duty to the cause of Pan-Asianism. But let us be clear, it will only be on our terms, not yours. Miscellaneous social costs are very high. Oof. Stability is very good, though. Very, very good stability. 66 days left, 70, 70, not bad. Therefore, I swear to you, headquarters of Sony Corporation, Ibuka lowered his cigar, or his gaze, not cigar, his gaze, <clears throat> uh, ever so slightly down the bronze, an assuming plaque, and sure enough, the familiar Ramos and trapezoid insignia was lying in silent way. Hello there, old friend. He opened his mouth as the words uh, surge up his throat, only to flap them shut again. A uh, logo physically could talk back after all. Truth is, calling his old friend of his, the Tokyo tele logo would be a misnomer, apart from its vague resemblance to the English letter T. All he and Akeo would have in mind when drafting an emblem on the drawing board was that he had to stand for something. Something that looks ashy, modern, able to race into the years to come like a badger at the head of a car. Something that always looked forward, no matter what lay ahead. Something that could have been very well been Sony, or even Sony's Lee Electronics. But then Ibuka just had to nip them all in the bud. For a self-proclaimed man of the future, he sure liked to stick his head in the past, refusing to even entertain the idea that the logo could stand for anything other than an old dead company. A company that he murdered with his own votes, his own hands, of course. Uh, and this was how he operated ever since that day, wasn't it? BSing his way through problems and pretending that he had solved them. He'd lose, he let loose little mentor and calling us upon Guangdong's hapless populace just to keep Okeo down for another year when he already absolutely had no reason to. He left large swaths of blue and white colors to rot, had cowered behind a veil after veil of brilliance, excellence, and competition just because he'd been too insecure to put his trust in anyone but himself. Well, since you wouldn't trust those people anyway, take a wild guess if they'd want to return to the favor to you. Or your promises ever. No prizes, though. Those rides were the best thing you're going to get. So, was he ready to trust again? He stood worthless. He didn't know. He was just stared at his old friend, and his slum apparently just pressed down on the doorbell. He didn't know. Ding dong! And against coming night. How far we've ascended atop the zenith of truth, how far we've journeyed out as we depart the eons past. But alas, devious, uh, devious are the machinations of our cosmos. Whispers penetrate our borders, telling of conflict, of aggression, of cataclysmic schemes already afoot. Storm clouds converge, swirl, and roar across the East China Sea, and all of their all embracing darkness shroud in the skies, no matter our wishes, no matter our, all of our endeavors. There are things that remain beyond our control. There always are. Onward we strive, for there's only the future ahead of us. A neon light in the darkness, against threats both within and without, may Fujitsu's glory shine forevermore. Yes, Minister. I'm deeply afraid that it would not be profitable to invest further into the defense sector this time. As you are no doubt aware, we do not hold a stable standing army, and such 
There's a little justification for our involved costs. I'm more aware of our special position in the sphere, Prime Minister. After all, I am standing in the center of Koshu rather than the center of Tokyo. But as you prepare to hyperfocus upon Guangdong's geographical position within the sphere, where I am concerned for this economic position, where to grant your request, this economic vi viability would be diminished, and the sphere with it. Once again, my answer is no. You seem to forget, Prime Minister, that I am the head of a sovereign nation and fellow member of the East Asia Co Prosperity Sphere. Guangdong is no longer a mere asset of Japan. And I'm not your employee, nor your underling. I intend to contribute to the sphere's interest in a manner that stands in line with the national interest of Guangdong. After all, I've done for you, you dare to insinuate. Fine, the chief executive's office will see what action can be taken, but do you not expect to perform this favor without compensation? Remember that. Goodbye, Prime Minister. Fine, fine, fine. No corruption, my friends. We don't believe in a corrupt Guangdong. Of course not. Why would we? Incredible. 25% more quality, eh? 100%. Have you seen the news? He booked out to avoid it ever being in this position again as he stared over the stack of Chinese and Japanese newspapers. Unfortunately, both electronic and political engineering were fields that demanded constant answers to unexpected problems, and so here he was again, of course. But uh, all the same, these were the problems I had no excuse for not expecting. It had been all there in these papers for years now. The Japanese ones exploded clear as day between bouts of nationalist bluster. The Chinese papers were somewhat less clear, as if, if only for his book as an experience with Mandarin. And his differences from Cantonese. All the same, we could read with little doubt. Artificial, illegitimate, temporary, whatever was hidden behind the finer points of grammar and pronunciation. It was clear that China could no longer be ignored, and they certainly had not ignored Guangdong, indeed. They had held a special place in their heart. Hello? Could he just ignore all this? How much had he missed while following himself pity, even as Koshu burned? This would not do. For all he knew, half the planet was bearing down Christmas upon the government complex right now, turning the very weapons Guangdong had sold against him. What hidden disasters lurk, waiting to destroy them for all the hubris? After a brief moment of abject panic, he book of steeled himself. No, he was not a student discovering an unexpected question in the middle of an exam. He had the vast economic power of the backing of a superpower, and the vision which he, none could match. Could the Republic of China say the same? He grinned. Nothing had changed there and here. There was much work to be done, and then there was much work to be done now. He book a look at the clock to find an ungodly hour staring back at him. He sighed. Time to get started. Ragged insomnia. The papers were before him, of course, the real beyond a doubt, so it was a pen in his hand. The chair against his back, the kosher skyline outside his window sparkling as they always had. Uh, physically, he was seated comfortably within the office of the chief executive, indeed, but his heart felt like it was in free fall. It would have been so much better than just about Guangdong. Except it wasn't whatever his overinflated ego might tell him otherwise. It was about the continent-sized power keg named East Asia. One accident, accidental spark away from bringing it all down to flames. China and Japan. China and Japan. Two stupid chickens squawking and posturing and practically begging for the other for the hammer to fall. Once it does, hopes and dreams of the entire sphere will all go tits up. Guangdong included. Very, very much included. Screw sustainability. Screw Pan Asian fraternity. Screw you and your little five to me, Bukamasu. Never mattered in the big picture, and you never will. The stream after stream, cease a stream of headlines were burying their frame. Inkly fangs at him, just as the riots had done, and the thing all that was on three months ago. Maybe Guangdong was destined to perish after all, and evanescent a speck of dust like those papers like to whine about so much. <laughs> Maybe he too was temporary. He took off his spectacles and stared and stared until he felt the fog return to his eyes and the ringing to his head, and then he chuckled. So whatever was temporary, he was temporary. He was the Bukamasu, the chief executive of the state of Guangdong, the president of the Fujitsu Limited, and before that, Tokyo Telecommunications. Sixty-five years of his own life he had lived, nineteen of which tethered to this patch of soil by the South China Sea. It all might have been temporary, but it didn't matter. What matters, this place meant so much to him. And so long as it still does, he darn well won't surrender to the whims of fate, not until he draw on his last breath. He clutched on his pen once more, and the sparks flickering in his bared eyes. Guangdong had the right to live, to innovate, explore, craft, and chase its own destiny, not its own terms. On its own terms. Because it was, it was born of this world, and so was he. 10% more. And we'll get it. Ah, advancements, eh? As well as better industrial equipment. Sign us up, my friends. Excellent. And we will be, as they sometimes say, gold. And the relaxation. When Nagano Shugeto received a call from the Komai Kenoshiro that day in Koshu, he noted that Komai's tone was, always, was it always, as it always was been, or has had been. That was an affable, ruthless, loyal servant of the Empire. That was a good thing, Shigeto felt. Gods knew too well how many traitors and cinephiles there were in this heckle of a stake. All right, then, Komai, what's the situation down there, then? Well, you know, the Legislative Council seems to have returned to its usual fractiousness. Same old squabbling nonsense that used to dominate back in the early days, just after Suzuki fell and Ibuka took over, you see? And he did what, then? It seems that everyone, and he led by Ibuka and that, are indecisive beyond all belief about what to do about the looming situation in the sphere. Or, for that matter, how... Heck, how the heck are they going to confront the Chinese menace from North? Shigeto nodded. Well then, what of it? It's clear, General, if there was ever any chance to influence Guangdong towards Japan as rival place in service of the spirits now. 
Shugeto stayed quiet for a few seconds, the shame of having to put up with Ibuka and his BS for so darn long still stuck in his mind. Like a sore thumb. We didn't make a decision. Yes, Kumai, I agree completely. Thank you. He hung up the phone and started ringing up contacts left to right and center. Colonel Miyazaki and all the others, now that Ibuka, that one smug pencil headed mother effer a hole, seemed not to be making his own decisions anymore. Perhaps somebody more sound as it were could take them for him. It was an offer Ibuka could not refuse if he knew what was good for him. The poor, busy sods in Tokyo would appreciate it too, Shigeto knew. Look at that. Increase our seats by three. Look at all that. More miscellaneous income. We're racing into the night. Been 20 years, isn't it? Since we last sat down like this. Yeah. 20 years. 20 years of being high and mighty, not giving a flying crap about anyone else, and suddenly discover humanity convenient. Hope Kao Tao's. Uh, uh, we can buy you enough forgiveness for now, His Excellency, because I'm sure not going to give you any. I'm not here asking for forgiveness or reconciliation. I just want to get something off my chest, that's all. And what that might that be? Oh, look at this. You're going to build this and boost your head. I did horrible things, Kao. Made mistake after mistake. I kept wanting to cut off the fat off our marks, our markets when they already wasted away to the bone. I kept squeezing our workers dry just because I couldn't be bothered to see what they've been going through. I'm not asking you to forgive me for all this, Mikhail, nor do I expect you to. I just hope you can understand. I wanted to take another chance. That chance I never gave myself would have gone wrong. And don't you think it's already too late? Look outside, Ibuka. All those people. All those 20 years ago, they've been screaming to you, and you wouldn't listen. Now they're wailing, praying, trudging through night after a sleepless night about what the heck to do with their future doubt to them. All thanks to you. And you think they would just buy it after everything you've done? I don't know. God, I really, really don't know. But it wouldn't hurt to try, would it? And thus ends the story of the Silicon Visionary and his reconciliation with his past for now. Thank you so much for playing Guangdong. The devs have hoped you we've enjoyed playing as much as they enjoyed making it. The Ibuka Master had been much of a man of God as he had been a man of his own vision. Look at these two handsome people. Both of which, he now realizes, are products of his own fantasy. He wanted a success story. He made Guangdong to its uh, its unwilling actor. He jabbed uh, marionette strings into its arms and dangled it around for a farce, all to the content of his own heart, or whatever was left of it. It is thus that after the riots have proven his grip on state affairs untenable, Ibuka has elected to loosen it altogether. Supporters have expressed nothing but relief. Skeptics, on the other hand, decry a wasted potential, a social upheaval, and political uncertainty. There is one thing of which the chief executive is certain, however. Better to let other voices speak to him than suffocate them all, because a story is made of more than just one person otherwise becomes illusion. It is 1972, and Guangdong's light will flicker and falter in the years to come. May it be... Maybe it is better this way. Perhaps. That's awesome. Credits, thank you. So that's the end of this campaign for us. And we, you know, we just got the market done too. We're actually going to grow. The deficit's still pretty bad, but whatever. Uh, I've really enjoyed, I, I always enjoyed Guangdong, except that one time when I did Ibuka Masu and did the preservation path, that was god awful. Because I didn't know what was going on and like the game was seemed to be a little bugged. But regardless, the devs have truly done a fantastic job, as I will always say in the end, because they, they they've done so much. Wow. People's Republic of France. I did not see this earlier. Jacques Sevogat. Sevogat. I, I don't speak French. I'm so bad at French. Actually, Brady looks like a... Did it get bigger? Maybe not. But anyways, oh, regardless, they're still doing the saver vote there, but you, I love TNO so much, and they it's just so much fun, usually. Uh, but yeah, the devs have done a fantastic job. Please let me know in the comments below what you thought of Ibuka Masru, and maybe this path or the other path as well, whether it's a preservation path versus this reconciliation path. Let me know in the comments below what you think. But if you enjoyed the campaign, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we will be in a different campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a tremendous, tremendous rest of your day.